Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's, uh, well, it's Friday. It's time to talk about what happened during SpaceX's flight test number eight of Starship and Super Heavy. And you probably heard by now that it didn't quite go according to plan. This was supposed to be like the fix for the previous flight. On the previous flight, they wanted to demonstrate that they could take a Starship to orbit, have it deploy some payloads, have it, uh, you know, perform a mock D orbit burn so that they could feel confident putting this starship into orbit for reals next time. This is the V2 version of the starship. They've made some changes from the first six flights. There's like changes to the heat shield, changes to the internal tankage, plumbing, raceways. And on the previous flight, that was the maiden voyage. As we know, it did not go according to plan. On this flight, it did not go according to plan. In fact, it happened, it failed in almost exactly the same way. Okay, so we skip forward. The initial launch and liftoff was pretty much perfect. It was spectacular, uh, impressed everyone on the ground. It was a lot better than it would have been had it flown on Monday when the weather was terrible. I love this view showing the exhaust plume running up and we're going to see that a whole lot more. But at this point, you see the booster has been going mostly straight up, and now it starts to pitch over to put Starship into the correct attitude. Uh, remember, the, the more it goes up and the less it goes sideways, the less the booster has to do to come back. Yeah, uh, ex engine shutdown sequence here, you'll notice there's a slight lag here. Now watch as the engines come back down. We have two that do not relight, but um, you know that's actually not... We had that on a previous flight, the engines didn't relight. From this view, again, check the exhaust plume, check the booster headed backwards, under power from all those engines, and of course the beautiful long shadow here being cast. The sun, of course, this launched uh, just before sunset, so the sun is at a very low angle here. So now, the second stage, of course, has lit all six of its engines. And uh, we, we don't get to see that just yet, but we do have a camera view, which is going to be very critical for understanding what went wrong. Again, camera looking down the side of the booster here. Yeah, this is the this is the view here that we're interested in. So this is inside the skirt. This is the top, right? This is the leeward side. We've got the two uh, vacuum raptors, three sea level ones in the center. Notice, by the way, this really cool uh, mock diamond thing that's visible here. This is a sea level raptor. It's in a firing in a vacuum. It shouldn't be visible except that there's pressure from these sea level ones or sort of vacuum raptors squeezing these in to create these little shocks. Also, look, really cool long shadow there. Anyway, booster coming back. Um, and it's it's basically shut down its engines. They went for the boost back, and it would begin falling down. So yeah, once again, yeah, you can see these two little points here yeah very cool really fantastic shot of the hot staging ring getting ditched off and it doesn't relight the engines but it does blow gas through the engines which presumably helps push the uh, the spacecraft along past the uh, hot staging ring so it clears it again amazing shot of the, uh, the staging ring there in future boosters they will, will not have to dump this it's just that it simply doesn't have the fuel margins to perform the landing with the extra mass on board. Again, this is them. They're getting ready to make sure the engines are ready for landing, so they have to run the whole the engine chill down. So yeah, this shot's kind of interesting because it's obviously from one of these monochrome long-range tracking cameras. Uh, you can see that they're blowing gas through the engines. This is presumably them making sure that they are still chilled down for landing. And you'll notice that as the air, as it hits the air, that gas gets entrained inside there. And that is what we see burning. They're blowing methane through there. And so it's totally expected that we see the methane getting you know, burned inside that space. The engines themselves, of course, sit above, uh, like there's a heat shield in there. So the part of the engines that need to be kept cold are still insulated from this. But yeah, that's us understanding this whole uh, phenomena with a little more detail. So, it's now slowing down, still slightly supersonic, engines light. And you'll notice that we got only one of those engines failed to relight this turn. 
big sonic boom on the ground and it comes into the tower a little more aggressively this time or rather a little more vertically and i think this is trying to avoid hitting the tower with the rocket exhaust this time so they've adjusted their descent but yeah they go in for a successful catch fantastic you can also see that the uh you can also see the arms are rotating back so notice the whole arms sort of turned to the right and then are now bringing the booster back that's pretty neat they're able to like handle translation errors now back to the starship in space we've got the sun we've got the exhaust plume and uh, we're looking backwards along the trajectory. Inside the skirt, we now see a red glow. We see what looks like a fire. We see a tiny hot spot on this vacuum raptor here. That is the one in the two o'clock position. And that's a sign that we have a fire in here, which was the pro cause on uh, Flight 7. That fire clearly propagates enough that finally this raptor goes out and then the two sea level raptors and the third one goes out. There's a cloud of smoke and the whole thing starts you know, spinning because these two do not have any thrust vectoring. They are firing off center and the vehicle is just going to uh, spin this thing up as they continue to fire. It's interesting that they continue to fire, by the way. While they do that, you can see the propellant levels bumping up and down. That's because the fuel in, and the propellant inside is sloshing. And as it sloshes around, it hits the sensors and it uncovers the sensors. Similarly, it's going to uncover the propellant feed lines to these. So we shouldn't expect these to last particularly long because as soon as voids get in the propellant, that will hit the, the turbo pumps and you'll get speed changes. And that will eventually probably damage the engine and cause a failure. But at this point, it is not under control. It is beginning to lose altitude, as you you see here, and eventually it's going to follow a fall out of the um the launch corridor, and maybe the flight termination system activates, or maybe something else. If it is spinning up, maybe it spins so fast that it literally breaks something. Uh, it's really not clear what actually leads to the failure of this, but downrange. We do see a bunch of people uh, watching the images. So yeah, downrange, I have this footage from Trevor Malman who shot this on his iPhone 16 Pro. And that great thing is that means we know the exact timing of when this happened. Uh, and we see a series of failures. And notably, we also see that the cloud being generated is spinning, it's rotating. I think this is rotating about, uh, you know, maybe 15 RPM, maybe more. So this is from Florida. It's passing to the south, again, heading out over towards the Caribbean. I think it passes like pretty much just a little south of the Bahamas. So of course, with the debris re-entering, it's time to activate ATC. This is a bit of you know, like tracking starting like an hour before you see the aircraft are using this whole area. And then once it gets to about the launch time, which is 2330, everything is clear down here, but they're still crossing in this area. Then when the debris event is declared, everybody is suddenly being kept out of this extended debris area and then once that's you know they're sure all the debris fall down they have they allow them back through and everything that was uh, held on the ground is now flying again okay so this event is big enough that you can see it on satellite imagery goes 18 that is on the west coast but because it's on the west coast is kind of looking at the launch site at a kind of low angle so you actually get to see the exhaust plume shooting up towards the sky and casting this shadow down range. If we step forward a bit more, then you see the whole boost back happening down this way. Right now, if we uh, continue to run this forward, this frames here, right? This is looking at upper level water vapor, band eight. Uh, if we step back, there's two different points on that. This one may be coincident with the larger event. These two images are like a minute apart, which is unusual because these images are usually taken at a much lower cadence. They must have had the high frequency uh, viewer pointing at this specific region to bring that up. Similarly, the effects are visible downrange in uh, the weather radar from the Bahamas. So now let's rewind and talk about some of the questions I have. First of all, obviously the fire was bad, but we can see this diffuse fire here. It's, this is something separate here on this vacuum raptor because if this fire was causing that heat, then you would be seeing the same heating on everything else. So is that the source of the flames? Is that the source of the gas? 
How is that related to the bigger problem? Is there a fire still above the ceiling despite all of the hardware that they added? The next thing is we f- see telemetry all along for a long time through this uh, you know event. Simultaneously on the ground, we see lots of people photographing this and showing this. It is a good amount of time between this thing spinning out of control and losing signal. Was this killed by the flight termination system? Well, interestingly, partway through this, about eight minutes in, you hear them say flight termination saved. And that is coincident with what you would expect if it had completed its burn into orbit. I think that is just a call out from somebody reading the timeline rather than looking at the actual uh, spacecraft. So I think the flight termination system is probably still active and it may have triggered partway through the descent. However, there are images showing a very substantial cloud and possible particulate debris from the ground which lines up with footage still coming from the spacecraft. So were chunks breaking off of Starship at this point? I noticed it was spinning about, you know, 16 RPM. That would be about 6 Gs at the tips. Was that enough to break the header tanks off or something? I don't know. But the most important question is, is this the same thing that killed booster number 7? If you remember, they did this very long test firing, like to run it at several power settings, see if they could trigger harmonics in the structure that could lead to, you know, fatigue and breaking of pipes. I suspect that they may have fixed some of that. I suspect that they also added in extra fire suppression and extra sensors to see if they could understand the problem. And perhaps they thought they had a solution, but there wasn't a 100% solution. In fact, this booster failed before the other one, right? And this might be related to changes that were made to the V2 spacecraft. They now have multiple downcomers from the upper tank to the lower tank. So... That might mean that because you've got more piping, you've got more places for like your harmonics to build up. If you think about it, pipes can just be like a guitar string. You know, you pluck them, you hit them at the right resonance, they shake and they can come loose. And perhaps that is a similar kind of effect to what we are seeing in this flight. So, of course, SpaceX engineers will be looking into this and they will have a lot more to go on. I know that they've got more footage because we actually see on some of these screens people looking at footage from different angles. They obviously have all the vehicle telemetry. They probably have a bunch of secret cameras that are stuffed in places that are basically too sensitive to share with us plebs on the outside. I mean, I know that they've had cameras inside tanks because we've seen those previously. But yeah, this one in particular, you see bringing up a bunch of different angles, showing like the spin, showing moments before the spin, and rewind, and he brings up one particular angle which shows a view from inside the skirt which turns into an explosion. So maybe that will contain clues about what exactly led to the failure. Maybe they'll be pausing and stepping through it but we don't know because they cut away to this denying us the information that we so desperately want instead we're going to have to wait on their particular schedule for them to decide what they're going to do next are they going to make further changes to the v2 starship is there something in the flight profile which can only be simulated in flight we don't know but uh yeah we'll be paying attention to all that and uh, hopefully we'll get to see some flight in the future now (laughs) Of course, at this point, people are starting to say, well, wait a second, eight flights and you still haven't got to orbit? I mean, come on, even Astra got to flight in eight flights, got to orbit in eight flights. But, you know, to be fair, this is hundreds of tons of stainless steel going into orbit. And they've purposely stayed short of going to orbit so that they know that they can safely bring it down. So, yes, they could have got to orbit if they wanted And they've demonstrated they can recover. They've now just upgraded their spacecraft and they've done that whole, the best part is no part. Well, sometimes the best part is that part that you took out because you thought that it didn't make sense. And I think that's what they're going to find out. They're putting stuff back in. We'll, you know, we'll get to see another flight and maybe it won't end in an explosion. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.